Good morning. Good to see everybody today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being in the Fellowship Hall, Fellowship Hall people. Thanks for being here online, wherever you are. Thanks for being here. If you're not here and you're just joining us online and you can't smell the awesomeness that's coming from the Fellowship Hall, that we will all be eating in a little bit. And unfortunately, if you're watching from at home, you won't be. Um, I'll eat your portion. Um, so, good to see everybody. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 3. We'll get there in just a minute. Um, April 17th, 1964. Something, something very unique and something noteworthy took place in America. Some of you may know what it is. Some of you may not. Jeff may know what it is. April 17th, 1964 was the introduction to the American people, this little beauty. The 1964 Ford Mustang made its debut and the crazy thing about this car was the effect it had on people the day it was released. Some things that happened all across because it all rolled out at the same time in dealerships all across the country. Uh, a Mustang had been chosen for a, to be the pace car at a race in Huntsville, Alabama that night. Uh, as soon as it entered the, the track to start making its rounds, Thousands of people rushed down to the edge of the retaining wall, climbing the wall, going onto the track just to get a glimpse of it as it came by. And the race was delayed for like two hours while they tried to get people off the track from trying to look at this car. A cement truck crashed through plate glass window of a Seattle Ford dealer when the driver lost control of his vehicle. The reason he was driving down the road, saw the Mustang behind the glass and couldn't take his eyes off it. And as you know, when you watch something, you end up going where? Right for it. And he drove his cement truck right through the plate glass window. Uh, a Chicago Ford dealer had to close the room, the showroom, because too many people were just trying to get in. He had a thousand people trying to get in to see this car. Uh, a Texas dealer put a Mustang up on a lift to show uh, a potential buyer what the underside looked like. And so many people crowded in around underneath the lift, they ended up having to le leave the Mustang up on the lift for the rest of the day because people were just standing underneath looking up at it. A New Jersey Ford dealer had only one Mustang, but he had 15 people who wanted to buy it. So he did what any rational businessman would do. He auctioned it. <laughs> uh, the guy who won the auction, though, this was 1964, so you can imagine. The dealership said he couldn't take the car off of the lot until his check cleared. Now, for kids, you, you don't understand this, but there was a time when you actually wrote checks pieces of paper that, you know, you write them out and then you would give it to somebody and they would accept that as legal tender. And then they would deposit it into a bank and then their bank would put it in a thing called a mailbox. Okay. I know I'm just blowing your minds this morning and, and it would be mailed to a clearinghouse bank. We would then verify the funds and then send it back to your account saying the check is cleared. It usually took five, six, seven days sometimes for a check to clear. Well, the dealership wouldn't let it off a lot until the check cleared. The guy who won the auction was so worried that somebody would come in and the dealer would sell it at a higher price. He actually slept in the car for six days until his check cleared. Also, he could drive home his 1964 Ford Mustang. Back in the 90s, I knew a gentleman in Montana who actually owned a 1964 Ford Mustang. In, in, in 1992, it had 22,000 miles on it. He would take it out if the weather was perfect, if it wasn't raining, if it wasn't snowing, if the sun was shining, he would take it out, he would drive it around for an hour or so, and then he would take it back to his shop where he would put it in and cover it up until the next sunny day when he would do this again. It was his baby, and it was in mint condition, and he treated it as such. What makes people get so excited what makes them lose their mind over a car i mean albeit i would love to have that in my driveway 
And I would probably leave it in there until it was a nice day, and then I would get it out. And I can drive that to the beach. Anybody with me? Now, if it was a convertible, yeah, totally there. Totally there, right? Okay. Sometimes things just excite us to a level that we don't understand why. There's a passion within us that says, ah, oh, I've got to have that, right? We've been talking for a couple of weeks about the church in, in Colossae. And, and for the last couple of weeks, we've seen that, that there have been these folks who have come in and they have tried to, to convince the people in the church to do things in a different way. They've tried to impose new rules, new regulations about worship, about angels, about other things, trying to tell them that if you do it this, this way, you'll be more acceptable, more spiritual. But, but as we saw last week, Paul wrote that, that, that these rules and these regulations that were being imposed, or any rules or regulations really that are imposed upon us, really have little value um, in restraining us and keeping us from actually doing. We talked last week about how that's something we have to want to do, okay, rather than something we're, we're necessarily made to do. We saw that in chapter 2, verse 23. Um, in other words, the rules and regulations aren't going to change who you were. Only Jesus could do that. Okay. And Jesus can, but at the same time, at the same time, by the time we get to chapter three, Paul is going to say, I, I understand what I've said about the, the, the rules, but you need to understand that God expects change. He expects you to be different than who you are. He expects you to grow. He expects you to mature. He expects you to become more and more and more like his son. We call that growth. We call that maturity. Let's pick it up. Colossians chapter 3. Let's read the first um, 11 verses together. Again, he starts off, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, that's us. That's us. That's us Christians. We have been raised with Christ through baptism. We've been buried with him in the waters of baptism. And we've been raised up with him. Romans chapter 3 teaches us this. Okay, if uh, just, just to set the context of who he's talking to, he's talking to us, right? If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. Not on things that are on earth. For, your, for you died. And your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, to impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also lay them all aside, wrath, anger, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, since you put off the old man with its evil practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is in all and all in all. Okay. God expects his people to change. He expects us to conform more and more to the image of Jesus. He expects us to be moral. He expects us to be spiritual. He wants our lives to be pure. He wants them to be undefiled. But at the same time, God also knows there's a better way of achieving that end by the, by, than by asking us to just to keep a list of do's and don'ts, okay? And, and I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, well, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Kim, but in our text, there was a list, right? There was another list of those things that you're not supposed to do. And, and you're right. It's almost as if Paul is saying, if you need a list, here's a list. And, and he says, here's the things that shouldn't be in your life. Sexual immorality, lust, greed, rage, slander, evil desires, impurity, anger, malice, filthy language. We get that, right? There's our list. There's our don'ts. There's our don'ts. Okay? But, but here's our point that we learned last week from chapter, 20, chapter 2. Here's the thing. Knowing the list, simply knowing the list, isn't going to change your behavior. You're going to have to want to. You can know the list all day long. You can, you can recite the list all day long. You can, you, can, you can memorize the list. 
but it won't change your behavior. Okay? In fact, it's a proven fact that the more we focus on what not to do, the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as to what we will do. Because here's the thing, just like the guy in the cement truck drove his cement truck through a plate glass window because he was focused on that Mustang, we too will gravitate towards what we focus on. Whatever our focus becomes is what we will move towards. Okay? We know this is true. How many of you, I know I've used this analogy before, mowing a lawn, right? If you're like me, you're probably not, but if, if you suffer from the curse that, that I am... I am cursed with and that is the curse of when you mow the lawn having to make sure that the lines in the grass are perfectly straight so that when you're done you have perfect lines running back and forth right Any, anybody else have that, have that? Shane I, I, I knew it before I thought about it I said Shane Shane will be the guy who who like me got to be lined up right and, and the only way to keep them straight is to pick a spot on the opposite end and you walk right straight towards it and then you turn around, you do it again. Okay? You keep it straight. We gravitate toward what we focus on. Now, and let, let me say this. For you parents out there, okay, you, you know how this works, right? You get your three-year-old, your four-year-old, and, and you put them in the front seat of your car. And, and in today's cars, they come with this humongous screen, right, with all this touch screen stuff about, you know, there's GPS, there's playlists, there's everything's right there, right? And your air conditioner controls and, and everything's right there. All these bright, shiny buttons and they're flashing and they're right there. And you look over at the four-year-old and you say what? Don't touch it. Now, as soon as you say don't touch it, what is the only thing that child is thinking about doing? Touching it. We're no different. We're no different. As soon as we fixate on what not to do, that's what we think about. All right? We're going to do a little experiment. You ready? I love these. Audience participation. You ready? Here you go. Bet you never thought you'd see a pink elephant in church, right? All right, I want you to study this picture. All right? Really study it. Okay? Everybody got a good look at it? Okay? See the little white birds up on top? Um, this, this is not a doctored picture, by the way. This elephant is actually pink. Um, it was actually painted pink. It's in India. Okay. Um, color of the grass. Birds. See it? Everybody, everybody got that picture? Okay. All right. Now do me a favor. Close your eyes. Play along. Close your eyes. Do not think about that pink elephant. I mean it. Don't think about the pink elephant. Don't think about the white birds on its back. Don't think about the green grass. Don't think about the pink elephant. How many of you right now are thinking about a pink elephant? Exactly. Oh, you can open your eyes. You get my point. You focus on something and then you, you pay attention to it and you look at it and then someone tells you what? Don't. In order for me not to think about a pink elephant, I have to think about what not to think about, which is a pink elephant. Okay? Here's the problem with the rules. Here's the problem we talked about last week. Okay? If, if I look at it and I study it and I fixate on it, if I say, okay, sexual immorality is bad. Sexual immorality is bad. Sexual immorality is bad. Bad. Sexual immorality. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. What am I only thinking about? Sexual immorality. Guess what's going to invade my life? That which I focus on, because that is what I will gravitate towards. Okay? Makes sense? That's why Paul, at the very beginning of this, says what? Don't think about this stuff. Think about what's above. Set your minds on things above. Change what you think about. Verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not the things that are on the earth. He uses some very strong language here to drive this point home. In verse 5, he said, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. In other words, get rid of them, put them to death. Put to death those sinful things. And I really believe, especially because he's just told us where to fix our minds, things above, he's telling me not to think about those sinful things. Consider them dead to my way of thinking. 
Verse 8, he tells them to lay them aside, put them aside. If we focus on what we're not supposed to do all the time, we'll end up doing what we don't want to do because that is what we're focused on. Okay? He says, lay them aside, get rid of them. Not only the actions, but the thoughts which lead to those actions. Th think about it this way. How many of you have ever had a mouse in the house? Anybody just love having mice in the house? Do you really? Okay, everybody who has that. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. I was going to have everybody bring their mice to your house. Um, let me, anybody ever use one of those traps to get the mice? Right. I know it's not politically correct today to use those little traps because it's cruel. I use them. Right? Uh, it gives me great satisfaction to hear that. Snap! I know it's kind of sick, I, I, but I, I just know, got him, <laughs> right? Um, but let me ask you something. How many of you have ever walked in to find a mouse in a trap? Dead. Anybody? Yeah. Aside from the, aside from the feeling of accomplishment that you get when you look down and see it, right? What do you do with it? You pick it up, right? And you examine it. If you're like me, you're like, how long is that tail? Right? And you kind of gloat a minute. And then you take it into the living room and you lay it out on top of the TV for everybody to see. No? No. Oh, okay. I know. You, you take, you go into, you go into the, your wife's cupboard and you get out some little Tupperware dishes and you open up a Tupperware dish and you lay the mouse in the Tupperware dish and you seal it up and you put it in the refrigerator. Don't do that. No, Bev's giving me this. No, do, I know. I know. We take the little mouse out of the trap, right? We carefully run a little string through its body, and we hang it from our rearview mirror so that every time we get in the car, we can go, look what I did, right? No, that's not, if, if, trust me, if I ever see a dead mouse hanging from your rearview mirror, we're going to have a talk, <laughs> okay? Because there's deeper issues at work there that we're not just going to discuss right now. But anyway, my, my, my point is simply this. When, when there's something dead in your house, you get rid of it right? You quickly take it out. You throw it away. That's what Paul's saying. You've put to death these things in your life that are not of God. You need to get them out of the house. You need to get them out of your mind. You need to get them out of who you are. You need to be, be done with them. He says, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Paul says those thoughts, those actions that lead to death, we need to strip them off. We need to take them off like, like clothes that have been soiled. And we need to do away with them. I was talking to Daryl uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, Daryl worked on, in, in, he was in the Navy and, and um, worked on ships. And he, he was telling me that, that he, has a, he has a box of uniforms that are covered in jet fuel. Is that right? Um, apparently I, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Uh, they would be on a destroyer. They would follow behind a, uh, an aircraft carrier. And then as the jets would come in to land on the deck, oftentimes the jets would have to dump their fuel before landing on the carrier, I guess, to prevent fire. Well, you can imagine if you're on a destroyer behind an aircraft carrier and the airplane's coming in and he dumps his fuel, guess who gets coated in JP4. Is it JP4? Is it still JP4? JP5 now? Jet fuel. So it's uniforms that, that have absorbed, and guess what? They still smell like jet fuel. Okay? And, and here Paul's saying, listen, whatever it is in your life that is staining your life, whatever it is in your life that is, is, is constantly reminding you of that smell, of, of that, 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 that odor of sin, you need to get rid of it. You need to throw it away. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27 tells us this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have what? clothed yourself with Christ. In other words, I've shed the clothes of my sin. I've shed the, 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 the odor, the stench, the, the death of sin. And I've put on these new clothes, which is now Jesus Christ. And I've clothed myself in that. You know, in Africa, there's a custom among the churches there that, that when a person is baptized into Christ, they will actually pile up their clothes on the bank and they will set them on fire. 
And, and as they're baptized, they're given a, a white robe to wear as they come up out of the water. And it's just symbolizing, listen, who you were before has been done away with. It's been dealt with. It's been destroyed. And now you have clothed yourself with the purity and the holiness of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, listen, if there's things in your life that are still like those old clothes, you need to purge them from your life. Not focus on them. Not put them in a bucket and keep them in your attic for years afterwards. Because they still stink. Right? But that's what we do sometimes. We hang on to those parts of our lives. Instead of being so excited about the newness of life in Jesus Christ. I just want to remind you of that this morning. How many of you remember the day you were clothed in Christ? How many of, the day, how many of you remember the feeling of knowing that your sins had been washed away, that, that you have become now a part of the family of God. The excitement that came, the energy that came, the hope that came, the, uh, like those guys with the Mustang. It's like, I can't believe anything is greater than this. I've seen tears flow from people's faces if they made that decision, that commitment. And we ask, well, why, why do people respond with so much compassion and passion? We, we all realize we needed a second chance. We all realize there was nothing we could do on our own to merit our own salvation. There was nothing we could do on our own to deal with our own sins. Somebody else was going to have to deal with it for us, and that was Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us when, when that takes place, we become, in, in Colossians 3.10, a new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We have a new self. We have a new life to replace the one that we fouled up on our own. We've got brand new clothes that don't stink. We got brand new clothes that won't wear out. We got brand new clothes that, that don't remind us of the death that we were in before. And now by putting on Christ, I can experience a love that goes beyond anything this world can even comprehend or imagine. I can have a sense of excitement and energy and hope and purpose that transcends even purchasing a 1964 Ford Mustang right off the, right off the showroom floor. Nothing compares to it. Nothing compares to it. I, I come to an understanding that when I'm baptized into Christ, when I put on Christ, I become the elect of God, holy and beloved, Colossians 3.12 tells us. I can experience love beyond. And all of that should provide me with a constant state of excitement and joy and thanksgiving and focus you see, if I constantly focus on all of what's wrong in my life and all of the sin in my life and all the problems in my life, I will gravitate towards that sin and towards those problems. But if I focus on what Jesus has accomplished in me, what he's doing through me, the blessings that come through a relationship with him, pretty soon my attitude, my life, my being will transform into a positive, energetic, focused Christian for him. And that's what we all want, is it not? Now, Paul gives us another list, not more rules and regulations, but, but kind of a, a self-diagnosis, so to speak. In other words, I think what Paul is telling us here, if you have set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, but, but things in the heavenly realm, if your head's in the right place, if your head's in the right place, then then your focus will be in the right place. If you've been given a new heart, if you've been given new clothes, then you should see the following translate into your life. We'll pick it up in verse 12. Listen to what he says. He says, so, in other words, because this has happened, so as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of, here we go, diagnosis time. Put on a heart of, of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, graciously forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, you should also. Above all these things, put on love 
which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, here, here's my self-diagnosis that Paul gives me. I look at my life, I look at my heart, I look at my actions, and, and, and I simply ask myself, okay, am I honest? Am I compassionate? Am I kind? Am I humble? Am I gentle? Am I patient? Am I, am I bearing others' burdens? Am I, am I forgiving others as God forgave me? Am I thankful? Am I praiseful? Am I teaching and sharing with other people the good news about God? Am I loving? Am I giving glory to God in everything? And I take that and I apply that list against my life and I diagnose my heart. And I say, okay, I, if I'm not living up to this, then I, the first place I look is not everywhere else. The first place I look is in myself. The first place I look is in here. When I look at myself and I see that I'm not those things, then I know that my focus is off. Because I'm gravitating to what I focus on. And if I'm not being honest, I'm gravitating towards something else. If I'm not being compassionate, I'm gravitating, I'm focusing on something else. If I'm not being forgiving, I'm focusing on something else. I'm not setting my minds on things above, on the things of Christ. I may be focusing on what somebody did to me or how they hurt me. I may be focusing on the guy who's not driving the way I want him to drive or doing what I want them to do. I'm focusing on anything but what I need to be focused on. And, and typically when that happens in my life, it's usually because I'm focused on myself instead of God. Me comes into the equation an awful lot. And too often my mind goes to the things of the world rather than the things above. And I forget I'm one of God's kids. I'm holy and I'm loved like no one else. I forget that I'm in a relationship with the God of the universe. I forget that I don't have to worry about breaking rules because when my focus is on what I'm not supposed to do, I lose focus of who I am as a child of God. When I was in high school, um, I, I did something I wasn't supposed to do. That probably doesn't surprise many of you. Um, and I got in trouble. I got in big trouble. Just, just to qualify that. Okay. Um, my dad was out of town. I really wish y'all could have met my dad. My dad was out of town. He worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield and he traveled a lot. And, uh, my mom and I were at home. My sister is eight years older than me. So she was off at college. Anyway, I got in trouble. I'm not going to tell you what I did. Um, cause I don't want you to go, Hey, the preacher did it so I can go do it. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, anyway, my, my mother, if you knew my mother, um, she was the prosecutor in the family. Um, no, she wasn't really a prosecutor. She was a school secretary, which means she's a prosecutor. Um, anyway, um, I, I got in trouble and man, she read me the riot act. Yeah, the rules that I violated and uh, the probable punishments that would accompany the breaking of said rules. And then she went into the psychological and sociological damage that the breaking of my rules would have on a greater society. Um, you know, um, on and on. And then, you know, she wrapped up her summation like Perry Mason at the end of a court case. And, and just, just so you know, my, my guilt was not in question. Okay. I was guilty and I knew it. Okay. And then she uttered the words that every mother utters 
when their kids are in, in trouble. You know what I'm saying, right? Just wait until your dad gets home. And I got to tell you something, I was mad. I was angry. I was angry that I was caught. I was angry that she was angry. I was angry that there was going to be punishment and I knew it was coming. And then I was angry that I was going to have to wait a whole nother day before my dad. And by the way, this was before cell phones. So you couldn't just like text somebody what was going on. You actually had to have a conversation, which is far worse. Okay. So my dad got home the next day. I stayed in my bedroom and I heard them talking in the living room and I knew they were talking about me and what I had done. And then the door to my bedroom opens up and my mother walks in and she says, you're not dad. Dad didn't want to talk to me. My father wanted to talk to me. Okay. And so I walk into the living room and my dad is sitting in a chair. He's got his head down. And I plop down on the couch and I've got my arms crossed and I'm, I'm mad. Right? Because I got caught. That's why I'm mad. And I spouted something to the effect of, I guess you hate me too. My, my best passive aggressive attempt at diffusing, you know, d displacing blame onto somebody else other than myself. Right? And kids, you need to understand something. This, this conversation took place 40 years ago. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Okay. And my dad looked up at me and he wasn't crying. He had big tears in his eyes. And he said, no, son, I don't hate you. And I'm not mad at you. As a matter of fact, I love you very much. He said, but I am disappointed. I'm really disappointed. And my heart broke. Give me the punishment. Ground me from my car. Go make me cut a switch. Beat me till I'm black and blue. I don't care, but don't do that. Anybody ever been there? Church, here's the thing. When we're worried more about breaking the rules than we are about breaking our Father's heart, there's a problem. Because we serve a God who we are called before every single minute of every single day. He knows everything that we do. He knows everything about us. Good, the bad, the ugly. He knows it all. And he calls us into the living room. And, and in a pure way, he looks at us and says, you know what? I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. Yeah, I'm disappointed in what you've done. But never, ever forget, I love you. Set your mind on that. Don't get me wrong. Rules are important. We need rules. We need boundaries. We need to know what God's will is. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, listen, what is your focus? Where is your heart focused on? And I pray today it is focused on a loving God who wants a relationship with you. Yeah, he wants you to change. He wants you to become more and more like his son every day. But you do that not by focusing on what not to do. You do that by focusing on him. Ask yourself this morning, when's the last time you were broken up in here? Because you disappointed your father's heart. 
Not just that you're guilty of breaking the rules. That's all of us. <laughs> but when's the last time you felt the disappointment of your father? This morning, know this. God is disappointed with our sin, but he loves us still. And because of that love, we want to do better. This morning, if you're not in a relationship with him, his invitation is open. Maybe, maybe today you just need the prayers of, of, of this body to, to wrap their arms around you and say, listen, I get it. Help me change my focus. I want to change. I want to be more like Christ, but I need help. Walk out of here today knowing, that, knowing this. Your father loves you very much. And let's love each other the same way. If we can help you with anything, let us know as we stand, as we sing.